Welcome to It's All About the Questions, where learning to ask the right questions can help you achieve a lifelong success. Now, here to help you ask all the right questions is award-winning author, international speaker, and business strategist, Laura Stewart. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone, and welcome to the week. As always, it is just a joy to be here with you. I, I love this time every week because I get a chance to engage with all of you listeners, 61 countries around the world listening to the show on podcast. Excited to be here. And today I have an unusual guest. Um, she came to us via somebody else who's been on the show, a dear friend, Cricket Freeman, who met her at a networking event and said, you must, must, must interview this person. And it's not just because her first name starts with Cricket as well. I mean, the odds of two crickets being in Vero Beach are kind of odd. But uh, we're just going to go with it. So today I've got Cricket McMillan on the show, and she is a paralegal. And every in the show, the regular listener, you know that I've been dealing with the loss of my mom October 1st. So I've been entrenched in a lot of legal issues, clearing up the estate, doing a bunch of that. And I've been working with a team of just exceptional. Not everybody has that option. They afford to have an attorney. They don't know an attorney or their situation such that they really need an attorney, but they do need some legal help with some different things. That's where my guest Cricket McMillan comes in. She owns a paralegal firm and it's really cool. And she's got people all around the country looking to help her so she can do support around the country. So please welcome Cricket to the show. Thank okay. you. It's it's so great to have you here because most people think of paralegals only working in law firm. This is true. And uh, many, many years ago I did Many years ago, I did work for law firms, and then I moved on <clears throat> to other things, and now I'm back doing this. In Florida, you paralegals are allowed to work on their own uh, after working for many attorneys that I just saw that they just charged way too much for what was happening. So I decided to do this, and I keep my prices very low so that those that cannot afford an attorney can still get some legal help. Well, you said that in Florida it's allowed. Is it not allowed in other states? A lot of states you must only only work for attorneys. But what what states are those? Uh, most of them. Most of them, okay. <laughs> yes. But yet you said that you can help people in a number of states so yes just those ones that allow paralegal well, work what we what we do is we we create the, the paperwork and we do it pro se which means that the actual client has prepared it so we don't put our names on anything um, and there are two things that paralegals are not not allowed to do and that is to um, we're not allowed to go to court with the client and we're not allowed to give legal advice. So the way we've compensated for that is I have created questionnaires for uh, just about everything. And when someone calls, let's say they want a divorce, um, instead of giving them legal advice, which I'm not allowed to do, I send them a questionnaire by email. They fill that out. They make an appointment. They come in. They bring the fee. And we have it done for them in three to four days. And we already know what they want because they have filled out this questionnaire. Okay, so when when you're looking at this whole idea of paralegals versus attorney, even if it's a state, I want to just make sure I understand this correctly. Even if it's a state that doesn't allow you to deal directly with a paralegal, you can help because those forms that somebody might want to fill out on their own can be very complicated. This is true. Um, the paralegals that I have, if, if it's a situation where they have to fill out forms, I use one of my paralegals because, frankly, I don't like filling out forms. Right. I like to do my own thing. So let's say someone wants a divorce. There's a divorce questionnaire. It comes in and my paralegal goes to that website in that county, in that state, most of all the time, the documents are there, but a lot of times when you go to the courthouse, you know, the only way they make money off of you is they sell you this great big package and you take it home and you have absolutely no idea what to do with it. There's more documents in there than you can possibly imagine. And 99% of them don't even apply or you don't need them, but the paralegals know exactly which one of those documents and we already have them in our computers. 
So we just do what we need to do, send it to them, and they're all done. Now, you didn't start out your career as a paralegal. This is um, a change for you. How did you get, we, we've been talking a lot about callings lately on, on the show. We've had a number of guests on. One I had on two weeks in a row, Father Michael Boccaccio, who's a dear friend of mine, and we talked about callings of all different kinds. It almost <coughs> sounds like becoming a paralegal was a calling for you, something that you were guided to move towards. I hadn't really thought about it that way, but I think you're absolutely correct. Um, I started out, <clears throat> excuse me, in my early 20s working for attorneys. Um, I saw the way things were, and I just didn't want to do it anymore. I just felt that I did all the work, they made all the money, and I felt that they were overcharging people for the amount of work that there was. So <clears throat> having two small children... Um, I went into real estate, and that way I was able to control my time and my own hours, and a lot of times I dragged them with me. And from there, uh, I moved from Maryland to Florida. I continued to do some real estate, and then I decided I wanted to move on, so it was almost a natural progression for me to move into the mortgage industry, and I owned my own company for 23 years. That's a long time to own your own company. Yes, it is. And I was doing okay, and then 2008 happened, and just like a lot of people, I lost a lot of stuff and nearly lost my home, and then I decided I needed to reinvent myself. So I went back to my original passion was the law, and I went back to college and finally got my college degree that was way long overdue and started my own paralegal service. Can any person who has a paralegal degree do what you're doing, or are there different levels of paralegal? Well, I think anybody can do it if they want to, but not everybody has, you know, the calling of an entrepreneur. Right. Some people need the structure of being somewhere at a certain time and doing certain things and have someone look over your shoulder. I'm not that person. <laughs> I need to do my own thing. Right. I need to make the decisions. And I've made very good decisions in the past, and I will continue to do that. So there is an actual college degree called paralegal something or other? Yeah, I think it's called paralegal science. Okay. And that is what I got the degree in. But having um, been a para having done legal work, in the past, a lot of that was very familiar to me. Uh, having done mortgages and real estate, a lot of that was helped me to help other people. And um, a lot of stuff, you know, and when you, what you're learning is something that you just need to know. And you need to know what the parameters are. Like you can't give legal advice and you can't go to court with someone. But so far I've done, a, I've helped a lot of people and I feel that I've done very well, and I would like to, you know, expand my business and continue to help people. Well, I love the whole concept of, you know, you started out working for an attorney. You saw the inside of, of everything that was going on. Then you left that, and, and you went into real estate. Not, not a normal leap that a lot of people would make, but in some ways, since depending on what kind of lawyer they were, you might have been dealing with real estate transactions. Realtors are a very entrepreneurial business. Even if you work for a bigger firm, you have to get your own clients. You have to do all that. Then the leap to mortgage. I want to talk a little bit about that because going, become, uh, creating your own mortgage broker company after doing real estate, what was the trigger for that? Were you finding out that people had difficulty with that or you just liked the whole um, convolutedness of it from the outside looking in. Well, when you're a realtor and you have a you have a, a a deal and you give it to a broker or a bank, you're at their mercy. You have to wait and see what they're going to do with it. I like being in charge. I wanted to know that when a deal came in, that I was going to get it done. And so I, I guess I just keep pushing the envelope to be more in control. I guess I'm really control freak. <laughs> <laughs> Which fits with the legal profession, actually. Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> you want to talk about an industry that needs to control every little aspect, dot every I, cross every T. Okay, so you went into that mortgage industry, and then the industry changed in 2008. 
you got your degree, but how did you wind yourself out of owning a mortgage business? I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a, when you, when you lose a business, like you had to, Mm -hmm. because of the way the industry went, what was going through your mind to say, okay, I can move on and do something different. Cause I have a lot of listeners that things end and they get stuck. Well, I was stuck for about five months. <clears throat> um, I was depressed. <laughs> I was about to lose my house. So I've been there when all these people come to me with these problems. I mean, I've had children. I've been divorced. There's been the, the custody thing. There's, you know, all of it. I mean, I've been there. So um, what was the question? <laughs> How did you help yourself get unstuck? Well, um, after sitting around and and feeling sorry for myself for about five months, I decided I needed to reinvent myself. I had to do something. I've been single most of my life. Um, I was married for a very short time to a cop and knew that wasn't what I wanted. So I brought up my two daughters by myself. And I'm still working many, 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 many years later. And I will probably continue to work until they cart me away. But um, it's just something that I enjoy doing. I like helping people. And, um, you know, I just went back to school because I've always loved school. So it was two continuous years of schooling and working a part-time job just to get by. And um, it just, it worked. I mean, sometimes you just do something and it works. I I love that. That's a great way to go into our first commercial break. We're here with Cricket McMillan. I cannot speak this morning. We're here with Cricket McMillan, uh, founder of Paralegal Temps here in Vero Beach, but she has uh, paralegals around the country that can help with your your needs. We'll be talking some more about some things that you need to be thinking about to help avoid probate and bankruptcy and a few other things. So we'll be right back. Cricket, we talked about how you had this sort of uh, change in career from mortgage. You had your own mortgage company to becoming a paralegal. Mm -hmm. What was one of the biggest ahas you discovered when you started your paralegal company, when people were coming to you? Was there something that they were asking you or that you weren't planning on doing that you realized, oh, I need to do this? I think that one of my most aha moments was that I was really good at what I did, and I was really helping people. And I love that. I mean, I've been helping people my whole life. Uh, with the real estate, I was helping people who wasn't able to go through regular and traditional um, ways of buying a house. When I did mortgages, uh, I did pretty much the same thing. I would go to private investors and get people houses that could have never gotten one the traditional way. And when I do what I do now, there are so many people that are sitting on things that they could have never gotten done because they could have never afforded an attorney, and now they can get them done. So my aha was, I really am helping people, and I'm very good at what I do. That's a huge aha, because so many of my listeners don't realize they're good at something, and Even if they are good at it, they can't acknowledge that fact for themselves. They put themselves down or they go, oh, I'm not doing the best that I can. There has got to be a better way. As an entrepreneur who is beautifully able to say that you're good at what you do, what advice would you give them to help them acknowledge that for themselves? Well, they say that if you do what you like, you'll never work a day in your life. And every morning I get up, I never know what my day is going to be like. And I like that. And I know that I'm what I'm doing is good because I'm getting, the people are getting the good results that, that they're asking for. Now, you, you've told me in, prior to our talking, and I've mentioned it, that you have other paralegals around the, the country yes. that are helping it. How did you begin to decide that you needed to expand the work you were doing outside of this area, this small town that is Vero Mm -hmm. Beach, Florida? Well, um, there's actually, it's kind of a horrible story in a way, (laughs) but um, I had 
contacted, I was looking for attorneys. When I first started out and calling it Paralegal Temps, I went to a lot of the attorneys here in Vero Beach and left my card and none of them called me back. So I was looking to do work for them, anything that was maybe over and above what they might have a, a secretary or a paralegal for. So that didn't happen. And then one day I made a phone call. It was a 1-800 number, so I didn't know where I was calling. And I got this guy in California, and he did marketing all over the country. And he wanted to hire me, and so I started hiring people who would do things. For example, Louisiana, they don't have counties. They have parishes, and their paperwork is very different than ours. So I had to find somebody in Louisiana to do that. And then he started giving me bankruptcies. And I'm like, I don't do bankruptcies. He goes, well, you better find somebody. So that's how it started. Um, I've probably had, over the eight years that I've been in business, I've probably fired 30 or 40 of them. Because (laughs) if you don't do it right the first time, you don't get a second chance with me. You either know your stuff or you don't. Um, So that's how it started. But how it ended was he was a typical con artist. And we had probably done 110 files that he hadn't paid us for. Oh, wow. So that's how it ended up being a really bad situation. (laughs) But then I knew that I could do all of these other things. And again, you know, it's something I had never thought to do before, before he, you know, pushed me into that. And again, it works because I get a lot of people with bankruptcies and it's a lot of work. And you got to know a lot of stuff about it. And even though I took it, you know, in school, they didn't go into all the details that she knows. So that works for her and I. And um, right now, I'm not. I'm trying not to take anybody in Louisiana. It's just too difficult. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of people that say Louisiana legal stuff is is very difficult. Yes. and it, it's an interesting state. Let's just put it that way. I know a lot of people that live there and have businesses there and i hear stories that would coming from new york and other places would just shake me completely like seriously that's the way they do business there it sounds like cricket you had this let's call it a failure Mm -hmm. okay as as you've kind of turned it that could have shaken you to the core and made you want to get out of the business yet at the same time The experience you got doing these other legal things and growing the business turned out to be the thing that launched your business. Right. Um, I don't take failure very well. (laughs) Um, I know what I can do, and I have no choice but to do my very best because I'm single and I have to pay the bills. So you pick yourself up. And you move forward. That's right. I love that. I love that. And we're getting really close to the news break. And when we come back from the news break, we're we're still going to talk for a moment. When we come back from the news break, um, Cricket's going to share with us some tips for people so their estate does not go into probate. These are amazing tricks and a few other things. But Cricket, just before we go into the news, is there one area of law that you believe is perfect for paralegals? I only do things in family court and civil court. I don't do anything in criminal court. That would make sense. Because criminal court, you need to have an attorney. And I've had people call me and I go, you know what, that's under a heading of criminal. And I don't do that. And I probably will be very sorry that I'm saying this, but the next thing out of their mouth is, well, do you know a good attorney? (laughs) And I go, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> and they go, huh? <laughs> yeah. I've, been, I've been blessed with some really amazing attorneys in my life. And I've been blessed with some that should never have gotten their law degree. But every business I've encountered people like that. Sure. There's like, good like, and bad people there's in good every and bad business. People. Right. Exactly. So anything that's not criminal is yeah. something that basically you can handle as a paralegal. Yes. Anything in family court, um, which has to do with divorces and custody and support, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I can do wills and the bankruptcies and mortgage modifications, and I write contracts, and uh, we do the chapters. uh, I already said the bankruptcies. Um, 
We write contracts. We write business plans. Uh, we do some research. Uh, we do. We can initiate small claim suits. A lot of stuff. You know, it's just there's so many things. It's hard to just list them all. Well, and I, I what I like about the concepts you're talking about are sometimes you just need somebody that understands the ins and outs and of what you need to check and what you don't need to check. So we'll be right back with more from Cricket McMillan, founder of Paralegal Temps. And we're going to be talking about the simple tips so that your estate doesn't have to go to probate. Welcome back, everyone. If you're listening to us live on iHeartRadio, you just got done with the national news and some commercials. If you're listening on the podcast, which hits iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and my website, it's all about the questions.com. You, you know, this was instantaneous. So welcome to the next segment with Cricket McMillan. We're here talking, do you need an attorney or will a paralegal do exactly what you need to do? And as promised, I'm, I teased you before the national news about some things that you can easily do to avoid probate. You know, I've been dealing with my mom's estate and I thought I had everything done. And then I discovered one account I forgot to put into the trust. So I ended up having to go into probate on that. And a few other things. So, Cricket, what are some things that people can do now themselves? They don't even need a paralegal or attorney, although they might want to talk to you about that to help them avoid probate. Maybe we need to explain what probate is. Let's start there. Can, how do you explain probate to somebody? Well, in order to go into probate, um, the government has their hand in everything, as you know. So we don't want them to be in our business. So there's three main things that uh, you can do pretty much by yourself that can. And and probate is uh, when somebody dies and there's some items that it's not clear as to where it goes. Well, if they haven't left it to someone, if they don't have a will and if there's not been a personal representative established, then the government just comes in and takes over. And you're lucky if you get anything out of that. I mean, I don't know exactly because I don't deal with that. I only deal with helping the people to do it. Okay. So um, the three main things uh, I'd like to talk about. The first thing is the deed to your house. If you're the only one on the deed and you pass, it will go into probate. Your children will not get it. So what you want to do is what we call a quit claim deed. And it's very inexpensive for me. I only charge $75, and I don't mind telling you right here and now what I charge. <clears throat> Excuse me. But um, what you have to do is we have to add at least one other person on there so that when you pass, that person has control over the property. Now, if you want to, like yesterday, for example, I a lady came in, and I she had four children and three grandchildren that she raised, And we put all seven of them on there. That's the first time I've ever done that. That's a lot of people on a deed. Yes, it is. But she bought the house brand new many years ago, and she's been the only owner, so it's free and clear. I don't know what it's worth. I don't usually ask questions like that. But So now she knows that it's going to stay in the family one way or another. The other thing is... Okay, before we go on to a question around that. Now, if somebody has a will that says so-and-so gets the house... Does having the, their name on the deed just expedite the process? Because in probate, who's meant to get the house will get the house. It just may take some time, right? Right. If you do the deed, it's an automatic thing. Um, if you don't do the deed and you do leave it to someone in your will, we still have to do some paperwork to make that person the personal representative through the court. So there's more documents and more money that you have to spend to get a judge to say that this person is the personal representative and now has control over your property. So it's just a a simpler way to take care of it and have it done, and it's the least expensive way. Okay. All right. So the quick claim deed, get some names on it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. The second thing is very simple, and you can do that yourself. Uh, If you own a car and your name is the only name on it, again, you want to add someone else's name on the car. But the other alternative is just to sign the bottom of the title, and then if you pass uh, in your will, if you say, you know, I want my son Joe to have my car, then we Joe can just write his name 
on the back of that title, and he now owns it. Because it's already been signed. Yes. But that also means that anybody who finds that title could theoretically sign it, right? Well, you want to make sure you secure the title somewhere <laughs> where not just any random person. Right. Well, I hope you secure your, your, your personal documents. <laughs> well, but you'd be amazed how many people don't. So right. I want to raise that issue sure. that when you're doing these things, it's a good idea to make sure that you're securing your legal documents. Absolutely. Somewhere. Okay. And um, the final thing, um, and I'm sure there's more, but this is what I've been coming in contact with, is bank accounts. And I know a lot of people don't want their children to know what's in their bank account or anybody else. But again, if you don't have somebody else's name uh, on the bank account and you pass, they're not going to be able to get the money out to pay your bills or whatever you need. Now, there's two ways of doing that. One is just to add someone on your bank account, which means they have the right to write a check just like you do. Um, Of course, you'd probably be smart to hide your checkbook, too. (laughs) But um, the other thing is a power of attorney. And the power of attorney uh, gives the person, who is usually your personal representative, the power to oversee what's going on. For example, I have a 98-year-old mother. And I have to watch her bank account very carefully because she's written checks to FP&L and they went to Citibank. So I have to make sure she's doing what she's doing. Uh, I have since taken that away from her and made the bank pay her bills. So there's a lot of things that you can do when you have older relatives or older, older parents. Well, there was recently in the newspapers here in Vero Beach about this couple on Johns Island who had some caregivers and the caregivers convinced them to put their names on check checking accounts and credit cards and, and stuff like that. And they were defrauded by over a half a million dollars. So it, it in that particular case, having a family member on those accounts and things like that might have, somebody might've seen it sooner perhaps. Yes. Um, I get, I get uh, my mother's bank statements in my email once a month. And then I call her and I say, did you write this check for so-and-so? And, And of course, half the time she doesn't remember. (laughs) But I try to keep track of it and make sure that, you know, I just got her some caregivers. But uh, I set that up so um, that I get the I get the bill and then they send me an invoice. They take it out by check uh, through the bank. And then, of course, I can see what they've taken out. When you think about putting somebody's name on bank accounts and car titles and quit claim deeds, because one of the things that you do is help people through their divorces, you know, we're not just talking older people that are doing this. This You could be 20, you could be 30, you could be 40 and have houses and cars and things like that. And I, I know somebody who recently passed away at, at 35. They just died. And... You know, they obviously weren't thinking about wills and trusts and estates and things like that. Are there things that you can do to protect yourself when you think that the person you're putting on there, maybe it's a husband or a wife, you know, a spouse, a significant other to help protect yourself? Well, I would suggest that you have one checking account where both of you are on it and each of you put X amount of dollars into it and you pay your bills from there. And then if you want to have a separate account, maybe a separate savings account um, with just your name on it or another checking account, uh, as long as you're open and honest about it, then maybe he has one too. Uh, That's the only thing I I can think of that that would work. And it sounds like you do wills as well? Yes. What are some of the things that people need to think about when they're creating a will? Well, again, I have a quick claim. I mean, I have a um, questionnaire. Right? I, I love the fact that you have these questionnaires. Yeah. We're and, all about the questions. Yes. Uh, the questionnaire just puts them on the right track to think about certain things that maybe they hadn't thought about. Like? Um, some people have stocks and bonds. They don't think about that. You know, they just think about their bank accounts or some people have just maybe one little stock and they hadn't thought about it. Things that uh, jewelry, um, artwork, clothing, things like that. Yes, yes. Things that you um, that you collect. Maybe you have a, a stamp collection or 
something like that, people don't always think about those things. So this prompts you to think about these kinds of things. It's so important in my mind's eye to think about what happens when you die. And I know there's a lot of people who don't. They're just like, oh, it's somebody else's problem. But if you love somebody, make it easier for them. Exactly. And that's where you can really come in as a paralegal to help people start thinking through that process. Right. And, you know, if you have a complicated kind of estate and trust and stuff, that's not something that you do, or is it? Uh, when you say do the estate. If you, if somebody needs um, an estate document set up, trust documents, can you say Oh, we trust do trust. Yes, okay. absolutely. That's great to know. Yeah. So you And a trust is uh, the things that go go into a trust or simply anything that creates income. So you can put real estate in there because maybe you have some rental property um, or the property uh, usually uh, increases in value. Um, You can put stocks and bonds. You can put anything that creates income goes into a trust. I love that. And we don't have enough time on the show to, to really get involved in it. But the whole idea is, that if you think you can't afford to get legal things done the right way to protect yourself, there are alternatives to attorneys. You just need to find the right kind of person. Right. Which, um, Cricket has been doing this for how many years now? Eight years. Eight years. That's a long time. And we're going to be back with more from Cricket McMillan about paralegals and the kind of really cool things that they're doing. We'll be right back. So Cricket, we were talking about three things that people can do to help not have their states go into probate just some things people can do on their own during the break i was talking to you about i have some clients that have some they're entrepreneurs and they have some contracts that they need to set up how does that work with a paralegal versus an attorney in terms of contracts are there any contracts that you can't do for a business None that i've come across so far okay so what kind of things in terms of contracts can you work on Well, first of all, we can set up a trust and we can set up corporations. Um, We can look over contracts that are already written to see if there's anything that should be in there um, and maybe something that needs to be put in there. And only because I have the background that I do with real estate and mortgages with contracts. I mean, I'm very familiar with contracts and Like I said, I've been doing this for eight years, so I've come along, you know, I've come across a lot of things, and, you know, I don't know everything, obviously, but I, you know, if there's something I don't know, I'll tell you up front, because I don't believe in wasting anybody's time or mine. And that's the point of all the questionnaires that you've developed, is to help you know if you can help somebody as well, right? Well, on the question, on um, contracts, I don't really have a questionnaire. I don't know that you can come up with a questionnaire that would fit for any, any and all contracts, but... You know, I've had people come to me with um, one man was going to rent a space for a restaurant and there was a lot of terms and things in there that he didn't understand. And, you know, I got to explain a few things to him and we did change a few things that he was much more comfortable with and that worked out real well. I have a number of friends who have rented space here in, in Vero Beach, and I had office space up in Connecticut and a couple of other places. And one of the things I noticed is how different leases are in Florida compared to other places. Have you found that often you can look over leases here and go, let's change this, and the landlords are willing to make modifications? I think it depends on what you need. Um I don't think they're willing to agree to some big things, but if they're just some smaller things that uh, really mean a lot to you, but maybe not so much to the landlord, we certainly, you know, you you always ask, like in sales, you always ask for more than you're willing to accept. So that's where we go with that, you know, especially like in divorces, for example, you know, the wife will say, well, he's only willing to give me this. I said, well, we're going to ask for that. And then if he gives you this, you'll be happy, right? Well, yeah. So you always ask for more than you're willing to to, to accept. <laughs> I, I, I like that concept because I can't tell you how many clients that have come to me to, to help them figure out their strategies for their businesses. 
and they'll say, oh, I signed this lease or I signed this contract. And I look it over and I go, did you have an attorney look over this before you <laughs> sign it? And they're like, no. And I said, okay, well, you're kind of stuck now. But at the renewal of your lease, I think you need to talk to an attorney. And now I know that there's paralegals, yes. too, that you can talk to. Because this is insane that this is in your lease. <laughs> I mean, I never would have signed something like that. Or, you know, this contract is completely one-sided. Yes. And a lot of people don't realize that it's a negotiable item. And they don't know how to negotiate. And that's something you can help them do. Absolutely. I, I love that. Now, I want to make sure that we have enough time to to share because you also your information how people can contact you because you've already got a really cool book that's up on amazon as well yes um i wrote about two years ago and i put it on amazon as a ebook for kindle and i don't think anybody's bought it (laughs) (laughs) people don't know about it i know exactly people knowing about this book but you know what i didn't write the book to make money on the book i wrote the book to get it out so that people could learn about what paralegals do and how to find one so i am willing and very happy to if anyone wants to contact me and wants a copy of the book i will be happy to download it by email for free and there's a lot of information in there what kind of things are in there Oh, all about the different kinds of bankruptcies, um, about trusts, about uh, divorces. I mean, there's so many different kinds of divorces. People don't know that. Um, we write uh, prenup agreements, um, just so many things that you don't know about. And then when you read it, you go, wow, I didn't know that. And then all of a sudden, it's like when you buy a new car and then you see 20 more on the road just like it. As soon as you get this information, all of a sudden, you know somebody who needs this. And you also realize that you need it because there's something that you didn't think needed a legal sort of look at that you could save yourself some money or some right. pain. Well, again, it's it's all about money. Um, like I said, so many people cannot afford an attorney. And then there are people who can afford an attorney. But if you can, why would you pay more? When I can do it for a fraction of the cost. Perfect. So how do people find you? How, do, how You can share email, website, phone, sure. whatever you'd like to share. Um, well, first of all, my email is paralegaltemps, with an S on the end, at att.net. <clears throat> my so that's paralegals, temps. temps. Paralegal temps at att.net. Okay. The website is www.paralegaltemps.net. And finally, my phone number is 772-978-0305. Say that one more time. 772-978-0305. And if you just Google paralegals in Vero, I'm probably the first 10 that show up. And I don't even know if there's anybody else in there. (laughs) Okay, perfect. So people can reach out to you if they have a a question, they're uncertain if they need some legal advice. stuff done they can i'm doing ums now forgive me everybody they can call you say hey i've got a question or they can email you they can go to your website and if they want to get the book they should email you or call you yes and i'll be happy just give me your email address and i'll be happy to download it for you perfect to me this was such a great show because i love to teach people or show people alternatives because you think there's only one way of doing things and often there is more than one. And I love that you shared how you lifted yourself up from failure and, and found your, your calling thank basically, you. which yes. is such a beautiful thing. So thank you so much for being here with me. Oh, today. it was my pleasure. And I want to thank cricket Freeman for, <laughs> for meeting you and saying, Laura, you must interview the other cricket here in town in Vero <laughs> beach. So to all my listeners out here, just think about what you might want to prevent from happening. And if you thought you couldn't afford an attorney or you need an alternative way of doing something, reach out to Cricket, reach out to a paralegal. If you've got a great attorney, there is nothing wrong with that because you know I am a huge proponent of having really good legal people in your corner. So Cricket, people can reach you at paralegaltemps 
at att.net and your phone number um, is a local number. I'll also have it up on my website. But remember, everyone, the right questions can change your life. What are you asking today? Have a great day. Read a good book and hug someone you love. You've been listening to It's All About the Questions, starring Laura Stewart. Connect with Laura at itsallaboutthequestions.com and download a free workbook that will help you ask better questions starting today. 